Hello, my name is Glenn Roseberry and welcome to another episode of Glenn in 10, where we make videos from Tanzania, Africa, sharing with you a little bit about what's going on in our ministry and what's going on in our lives as well. I want to share with you something a little different uh, this time. I, uh, I want to share with you a story about when I first came to Africa and then how that's affected my life since then. I've titled this particular video, Not On My Watch. Now, uh, that may be an unfamiliar term for many of you. For others, you may kind of know what it means. But uh, basically, a watch, um, if you look at it in military and naval terms, would be a time that a person is responsible and the duties he's responsible for. For example, if you were on a ship and you were on the fire watch, your responsibility would be during a certain period of time, say your eight hour shift, that if any fires were to come up, it was your obligation and responsibility to take care of it. During the course of history, there were two or three episodes that became a little famous where somebody was forced uh, or rather confronted with a difficult situation and it looked like things were gonna go perhaps the wrong way and they would proclaim not on my watch as though I'm not gonna allow this to happen for this thing I'm responsible for kind of taking ownership and responsibility for a particular situation. I had this happen to me in a most surprising way here in Africa. I, uh, when I first came to Africa, literally in my first few months, I went to a missionary conference that a brother had asked me to come to and I had agreed to, uh, to come to. And when I got there, it was just an awesome time. You know, I was a new missionary and had been in the field maybe uh, months, if, if not even just several weeks. And I went to this conference and I was surrounded by men and women, uh, particularly that had lived in countries where civil war was going on, radical Islam was the prevailing uh, um, force in that community or in that country. We had refugees coming in from Somalia, uh, Sud Sudan, Etria, uh, Ethiopia. We had brothers and sisters coming that had became Christians and had left radical Islam. We even had imams in this meeting that had left Islam and had come to follow Jesus. And they were literally ran, ran out of their country. Uh, some of them had their homes surrounded and buildings surrounded and, and the radicals had fired guns into their buildings. Other ones had actually been caught and tortured and beaten. So it was just an incredible thing for me as a new missionary to sit in a room with people that had, you know, uh, trusted Jesus and had given up everything. Some of these men had not seen their families in years, and uh, it was just an amazing time for me. After the meeting was over, I, as you might imagine, I was very excited about everything I was hearing and seeing and, and just praising the Lord. There was a brother there that had been helping some of these refugees and he had a method and a mode of helping people when, when they first came in, he would provide the financing. So for, let's say you fled radical Islam from Ethiopia and came into Kenya, which is where these conferences were at, uh, he would kind of pay for your uh, room and board as it were for about 90 days. And during that 90 day period, it gave you time to settle in, get used to the culture. And really you needed to pray and seek God for your own source of revenue uh, and your own ability to take care of yourself, which I think is a really great plan. However, I was watching him uh, have a conversation with this imam that had fled radical Islam. And this guy was literally being hunted in an area called Eastley, which is an area where not only were there a lot of radicals in the area, but uh, Al-Shabaab was operating there. This was a very violent time in Kenya. Uh, they had just a few months before blown up the Westgate Mall. There'd been various uh, terrorist attacks that had happened literally while I was there for that conference. Some people threw hand grenades in churches in the uh, Eastley area, which is where most people uh, that came from other countries came and lived in Nairobi as refugees. And a lot of Muslims and former Muslims lived there as well. And so it was a time of violence and, and time of persecution in a very dangerous time. And this brother was being so pursued, he really couldn't go out and find another job. Uh, and so he was there making an appeal 
to be taken care of a little longer. And then another brother of mine, and maybe we'll post a picture of these guys, uh, Paul, uh, his name was Imam Hussein. We had to start calling him Paul because so many Imams we were dealing with are all named Imam Hussein, uh, very popular in Islam. So we called him Paul. Well, Paul had also hooked up with a lady that, uh, and they were going around looking under the bridges and bypasses in Nairobi, and they had found it become customary for Muslim men, if their wife came to Christ, in order to try and get them to come back to Islam, uh, they would take any older children away from the wife that could assist her, and then give the wife the toddlers or even infants and drive them off into the slum area or whatever and literally put them out of the car under a bridge. And this brother had actually been providing home and housing and room and board for them for 90 days. So anyway, the problem was the 90 days was up and I was there as my brother was reminding them all that he had given them this 90 day to go before God, trust God to provide for them and that he was done, that now it was time for him to go on to other people that needed help for their first 90 days. And so he was very polite, a very godly man. He loved all these people, but he had, uh, he had a way he did things, and that was, uh, that was the way it was. And so he got up and left the table, and I'm, I was literally kind of being a fly on the wall listening to these conversations. And, and so I kind of slid over a little closer to everybody and asked if I could sit down. And of course, they were mostly speaking a Romo and Amatic because it just uh, so happens these people were from Ethiopia that were having this conversation. Although my understanding was the same thing was going on with some Sudanese, Eritreans, and Somalians as well. So anyway, they began to tell me what I've just told you. And uh, uh, it turned out they not only had these people, but other people. And so these people now had 30 days before they were going to have to fend for themselves or move out of those places they lived. And there were more people coming all the time from these countries, refugees coming into the Nairobi area that needed help. And as I listened to this story, something became apparent to me. Now, this was none of my business. I'm a missionary in Tanzania, and I'm just visiting Kenya. And I, I found myself in a situation where I'm out of my element. I certainly don't know anything about radical Islam, really didn't know a lot about Islam as it were. And uh, just being around these brothers and sisters was really my first experience to spend any time around any Muslims or former Muslims. And as they shared me this story, uh, man, my heart was just broke. And uh, I, this phrase that I've titled this video came up in a conversation. I, I told him I believed that if people back in America, because I'm from America, people back in America heard these stories that I believe I could raise the funding to help them transition a little longer into this new culture they were in. Uh, as a matter of fact, somewhere during the course of the conversation, when they were telling me about this one particular lady had been abandoned under a bridge and that she had no place to live and they were putting her up somewhere and the people said she had to leave within the week and she would be forced to go back to this bridge, live under it, or return to her husband who would force her back into Islam, I made the comment, not on my watch. I, I assumed, I believe before God, this responsibility that I couldn't let this happen. You know, in the early church, not a person among the church was in need because everyone shared everything. And I, I found myself in a situation to where without my asking, without my thinking, without any premeditated thought, without any prayer, without anything, I knew that I couldn't let this happen. But I also knew that there were people like me back in America that they heard these stories they would support them. So that's what I did. Over the next uh, five years, uh, we put we opened up multiple safe houses. We put bunk beds in them. We networked with other people that helped us, and we were able to take in multiple imams uh, that were fleeing persecution, multiple uh, mothers with their families, and put them up in places all over Kenya. Now I'm in Tanzania, and the reason I'm telling you this story today is because of something that happened yesterday. I, 
I'm here now. The crisis in uh, Nairobi has kind of passed. There's peace now in Ethiopia. The people from the Romo tribe are returning. We all know things have calmed down quite a bit in Somalia. Uh, the civil war in Sudan is over. The Atrian situation has calmed down so much, uh, somewhat. So a lot of these guys have been able to return to their countries and reunited with their families. Some of them have been away as long as eight years. Uh, but we praise God for that, and I was glad that you and I could be a part of that. And I say you, and that's because of those of you that actually have contributed to help in this ministry. Now I'm in Tanzania, and uh, I found myself in this situation all over again. I know I probably related to you the story one time when we left house church one time to find out one of our widow's sons had come and removed the made a roof off of her house during the rainy season. It rained in the house. It collapsed. And when I went to visit her, I found out she was living under a piece of blue plastic with all her belongings ruined. And um, I found myself in the same situation where I felt so compelled by God and, 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 and just so driven that I said, this can't happen, not on my watch. How can I have two shirts when... And the brother has none. How can I sleep on a good mattress when a widow has none? How can I have a mosquito net when the brothers and sisters have none? How can I have plenty of food when I'm surrounded by people that don't? And the answer is, I can't. And I don't believe you should either. So I have made a determination that I couldn't let this suffering go on anymore, not on my watch. Uh, yesterday, we had a brother send in an unexpected donation and I remember getting the donation, and almost before I could get the words out, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? I just had this 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 vision thing almost of, of all the names of people that we've been saying no to because we didn't have the funding uh, to help with operations. A lot of these were not so critical. We try to always take care of the ones that's life and death, of course, and those that are in high level of suffering. But we have a lot of them that are in kind of a medium to low level of suffering that need assistance and a lot of people that can get by with what they have and are doing, but it's a terrible struggle for them. And all these names kind of just came through my heart and almost as though they were a list uh, in front of my eyes yesterday. And, uh, and I just knew, I felt in my heart that God was saying, do it all, help them all. And those words rang through my heart again I can't let these things continue, not on my watch. And I just wanted to share that with you today, something God did and spoke into my life. And uh, I just thought, I just wanted to share that with you today. I woke up this morning thinking about you, and I wanted to say those words to you, is that, uh, you know, the least of these, our brethren, are all around us. And I know we think that's not my problem, and that's not my responsibility. And I say, I believe we're wrong I believe this is our watch, this is our time, and this is our responsibility. And we need to say, not on my watch will my brothers and sisters suffer. Not on my watch will the widow go hungry and go without a home or a mattress. How can they sleep on the ground when I got a mattress? How can they not have a blanket and tell me they're cold and I've got two blankets? How can a brother, who I found out last week, I guess I'd never paid attention. I noticed he always wore black, but I didn't realize until last week that it's because he has one pair of black pants and one black jacket, and he wears them all the time. How can I, who own so much and have so many pants and shirts and shoes, uh, how can I, who have so many, not help him who has so little? And the answer is I can't. And I want to say these words, and I hope you can agree with me, and you'll say them too. Not on my watch. Somehow, I don't know how, Jesus identifies with the suffering and he says how we treat the suffering is how we treat him. In fact, if we don't love our brother and say we love God, we're a liar. And I believe we should do it in a practical way. And that's my story. I came here just to make disciples and do evangelism. And boy, is God taking me, uh, uh, broadening my vision. So now we're still making disciples. We're still evangelizing we baptize 20, 30, 40 people a month sometimes, uh, but uh, I know I spend most of my time talking to you guys about the least of these, but perhaps this gives you a little insight into why I talk about it. 
And uh, I thank you for listening to this video. And remember these words. It's not on my watch. Are they your words? Can you say those words? Can you think about it? God bless you. Thank you for listening to Glenn and 10. Tell your friends about our video. Click the like and subscribe button. Hey, man, do me a favor and, uh, and post this and share it on any venue you want to to let your friends know about it. We'd love to let other people know about what we believe God would have us all to do. Thank you so much, and God bless you.